Okay. Assalamu alaikum. Bismillah. Bismillah walhamdulillah wa salatu wassalamu ala rasulillahi wa ala alihi wa ashabihi ajma'in. Let me go ahead and get the book on the screen. Let's see. Here we go. Okay, Bismillah. Welcome back, everybody. It's good to see you, Alhamdulillah. We're continuing our reading of um, the book by Abdullah ibn Mubarak called Kitab al-Zuhud. Uh, right now, we're still actually in the introduction by um, Sheikha Aisha Buli, who translated and gave a little bit of commentary in the beginning of this text. And we are at the point now where we're still in the defining point of what zuhud is. We talked a little bit about it. It's hard to define in one word. Um, the, the linguistic definition of it in English is asceticism, when somebody becomes ascetic. Uh, the functional definition of an ascetic is somebody who's not materially attached, someone who has no emotional investment into the material world, meaning that they're ambiguous or ambivalent, I should say, they're more ambivalent towards options, whether they are luxurious, whether they are simplistic, it's irrelevant to them, right? They have a deeper connection to something beyond just the aesthetic. So this is really something that, especially in our time, is a challenge. And um, we want to be able to define this properly so that as we kind of develop the skill of zuhud, we make sure that we're doing it in the right way. So the translator and the author, Aisha Buli, she puts forth some different examples of zuhud. And today we're going to finish. She compiled some of the prophetic hadith, the narrations that exemplify what zuhud is, so that we can kind of build our parameters. And then as we move forward, we're going to be able to have that road carved out for us, inshallah, that path that's trailblazed. Uh, so we finished last week with this line, which is, he says that one who is not overjoyed with worldly things when they have them, nor are they overly grieving when they lose them. So a person's response, their emotional response, when it's, doesn't matter really what the situation is, 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 is moderate, is tempered, um, almost to the point where people cannot tell if you're devastated or if you're excited. That understanding of connectedness. Now, this doesn't mean that a person doesn't have any likes or dislikes, right? It doesn't mean that. The Prophet ﷺ, he liked certain things and he disliked certain things. He had his favorite types of food and he had foods that he did not like. So you're allowed to have preferences. But zuhud is when your preferences don't drive you primarily, right? It's not really the, the, the function or the purpose of one's existence. And so he says that one who is not overjoyed, nor one who is not devastated. Saadi also said that zuhud is ridding the heart of what the hand does not possess. And this is addressing what some scholars call tool al-amal. You guys know what amal means? Amal, anyone here named amal? Have a friend or cousin? Second cousin? Okay, ah, there we go, we're good. All right, amal means hope. Amal means hope. So the scholars, they had a name for a person who had unrealistic expectations which means what? Lofty hopes, disconnected. They have no real grounding. They're not anchored. So a person who has these lofty aspirations, and their heart is obsessed with things that they don't have. I mean, the best way to translate this for our era is like window shopping. How many people can spend time looking at something that they don't have any real function or purpose looking at? Maybe it's not even affordable to them or it's not practical or realistic to them, right? Looking at buying a house when that's not really, right? Looking on Zillow.com when you're not really there yet, right? Who is there? SubhanAllah, may Allah make it easy. You know, buying a certain kind of car, like going to the mall just to look and, and walk around and not really even buy anything, but just to look. These are manifestations of this issue. And as much as it sounds like, and as much as it might come across as like, okay, that's, that's a bit much. I want us all to ask ourselves honestly, 
what are the effects of constantly exposing our hearts to more and more material things that we can't even have or we shouldn't have or we don't need, right? And we're going to talk about some of the narrations that are absolutely astounding when it comes to defining the word need because even need is a subjective word, right? Even need is very subjective. So Imam Ahmed said that zuhud means limiting one's hopes, reining yourself in, being, being spiritually practical. Not practical, because when I say practical, we automatically think economically practical, financially practical. I'm talking about spiritually practical. How is this obsession or this focus going to hurt or help my relationship with Allah? Not being overjoyed when things come, not being sad when they go. He was once asked if a man who has a thousand dirhams can be a zahid. And he said, yes, so long as that person is not, their happiness is not contingent upon the 1,000 dirhams. It, are they truly only pleased with Allah? And this is why one of the greatest dhikr of kar that a person can say is raditu billahi rabba. I am pleased with Allah as my Lord. It's not conditional. I'm not only saying that when things are good, right? This is the, the nature of the human being is that we're pleased with Allah when things are going well. And then when things don't go the way we want, we're like a little bit, you know, curiously silent, but can a person say that I'm pleased with Allah when things are going absolutely against their will? And can they truly mean that from the bottom of their heart? That's one of the tests of the Zahid. A man asked Yahya ibn Mu'adh, when can I enter the store of reliance and wear the uniform of the Zahid or the Zuhad and sit amongst them? What this is talking about is a story of a man who wanted to be part of this crew, right? So basically, when you reached the state of Zuhud, You'd be like the elite, not like exclusive, not like arrogant, but you'd be like those who made it, right? And so, subhanAllah, he said that the answer was, when your training of yourself reaches such a point that if Allah was to suspend all sustenance from you for three days, it would not weaken your spirit. That's how you know you've made it. So he's saying, like, how do I know? How do I know that I've made progress? And the answer was, test yourself. Can you... Suspend sustenance. I mean, I don't know if we can even suspend ourselves from coffee for three days, let alone sustenance, right? Imagine you're supposed to be paid every two weeks, right? Imagine that you're supposed to be paid and you reach out, you check your account, it doesn't hit. You call HR and they say there's something wrong. We'll get it fixed by Monday. Monday comes around, it still hasn't hit. Tuesday, it hasn't hit. How are you emotionally? You're not, you're not supposed to like give up your money that you worked for. You deserve that money. But are you emotionally dysfunctional? Are you, out of, are you out of it? Can you even have a conversation with people without being so rattled? Do you trust that Allah will get you the rizq that he has written for you? Okay. If you have not yet reached this stage, he said, then for you, sitting with the zuhad is mere ignorance. Like, you can't pretend. You can't perform this. Religiosity, spirituality, you have to get there. You have to earn it. A lot of times we want to wear the costume of really religiosity. I'm not talking about the Thobes and the Kufis. I'm talking about like we want to appear to be spiritual people. You know, on the Instagram bio, it says like, love God. But do you love God? I mean, you, love is shown in times of difficulty, not times of ease. Everyone can love each other when it's easy. Do you love Allah when times are tough? Right? Everyone has their favorite Quranic ayah in their bio. Do you live by that ayah? Because if you don't, then that ayah is more of an allegation against you than it is a proof for you. So let's, as we, as we venture to read this text, let's commit to ourselves that we're not going to be performers. I don't want to perform this religion anymore. I actually want to be a part of this. I want this to change who I am. I want to actually feel the effects of this. Now, zuhud isn't just about material wealth. It's also about how you see others. Because a person can actually be very good with being disconnected from the material world, but they can struggle a lot with arrogance and judgment of other people. You can find somebody that's so generous or so good with their heart, but when they look at somebody, they look down on them. So Hassan al-Basri, he said that the zahid is the one who, when they see somebody else, they say, you know what? That person is better than I am. 
they're more of a zahid than I am. Because this is one of the trials of religiosity. Think of the story of Iblis. Iblis's challenge was not that he was not a good worshiper. He was. But his fall, his stumble, was that he could not see the honor of the creation of Adam, peace be upon him. He couldn't see it. So when Allah created Adam, instead of just obeying Allah, it, Iblis had to have some, some comeback. Right? I'm better than him. So when we adopt an attitude of zuhud, it's not just about money. It's not just about appearing spiritually fulfilled and self-actualized. And I don't care if I'm having kebabs or dal. I don't care. Anyone can perform. But how do you feel in your heart when you see somebody? When you see somebody, do you think you're better than them? How do you estimate them? How do you, what's your initial thought about the people that you see in your life? Right? Do you think negatively or positively about them? Yunus ibn Maysara said that zuhud towards this worldly life does not entail making what is lawful unlawful. Because a lot of times people think, oh, if I'm more religious, I'm just going to cut off everything. I'm not going to do anything. Right? And we'll tell stories about this. Nor is it wasting wealth. So a zahid doesn't just get paid and then take their cash and throw it in the, in the dumpster. Right? Rather, it means having more certainty in what Allah possesses than what you possess. You have more certainty with Allah than even yourself. And this is one of those situations, subhanAllah, especially right now as we are seeing all of this happening in Gaza, where all of these feelings, all of these theories that we're reading about are being demonstrated. Part of tawakkul, part of trust in Allah is that you place your trust in Him even though you don't know what the solution is. It's like coming home knowing that there's going to be food, but not knowing what it is, right? And so zuhud truly is having so much confidence in what Allah possesses that you actually don't even have to think about what I have or what I don't have because you know that Allah will take care of it. And you have confidence in that with Allah Taala. It is to have the same temperament in calamitous times and blessed times. It is for your attitude to be the same toward the one who praises you and the one who criticizes you for speaking the truth. How do you guys feel when someone critiques you? What's the natural response? What's the human response for praise? This is going to blow your mind a little bit. How do you guys feel when someone says, hey, you're looking good? Feel good, right? Thank you. I've got all these like, humble, shy people here. You're right. Okay. How do you feel when someone says something nice about you? You feel good, right? Even if it's false. They're like, hey. Do you lose some weight? You're like, yes. You haven't stepped on the scale in six months. You have no idea if you lost weight. Yeah, yeah, I did. You just say yes, right? Hey, do you get taller? I think so, yeah, yeah, I did. Sounds about right, right? We will take praise even if we don't know if it's true. And criticism, we will avoid even if we know it's true, subhanAllah. So Omar one time said, and this is very beautiful, Omar said, I prefer to be criticized more than I prefer to be praised. Because he said, at least with criticism, I can fix something that's wrong. With praise, I can't do anything with that. If you tell me something that is good about me, that's fine. But if you tell me something that's wrong with me, I can change myself for the better. That's zuhud. A zahid, and what did Abu Bakr say? Abu Bakr Siddiq, when he was given the position of Khalifa after the Prophet ﷺ. You know, they, they, they elected him to be the Khalifa after because he was number two. I mean, he was the closest to the Prophet ﷺ. He felt this overwhelming feeling of shame. Not because of anything. Abu Bakr has no reason to feel ashamed. But he felt it because people thought of him a certain way. So he made a dua that's so beautiful. He said, Allahumma la tu akhidni bima yaqulun. Oh Allah, don't don't hold me to account for what people say about me. And forgive me for the things that they don't know about me. Right? Everyone thinks that I'm perfect, but they don't know who I am, Ya Allah. And then he says, uh, 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 he says, uh, And he says, um, I forget the third verb, but he says, He says, and, Oh Allah, basically, overlook overlook the things that they say about me and the praise that they give me for the things that they don't know about me. So when he was praised, his immediate response was 
and I say this very carefully, but again, this is 30 and up, so I can say this without, his immediate response was to feel ashamed. And ashamed, but in a healthy way. Not self-deprecating, not that, no. He felt shame in a way that was healthy, that kept him humble, that motivated him for, to become better. So a Zahid, when they get praised, they remind themselves of the truth of who they are. One of my teachers said that. My one of my teachers was very, mashallah, well-respected. Everywhere he went, people would kiss his hand, like that kind of person. And I remember going to him and asking him, Sheikh, like, how do you, how do you handle all of this praise and love? Because, you know, if it happens to people, like, it's easy for their head to get big and for them to feel inflated about themselves. And he said, anytime someone tells me something about me that they, you know, they praise me, or they kiss my hand, or they say, you've done this or that. He goes, in my head, I picture all the sins that I did that day. And that just deflates me completely. Because the ego is feeling off of that. And he's like, I just remind myself who I am. Right? Did I call my mom today? Did I do this today? Did I do that today? Just a reminder. And then the Zahid on the opposite side, when they get critiqued, when somebody gives them some feedback, they actually welcome that. They don't defend it. They don't defend it. And even, subhanAllah, some scholars say, even if it's not true, you just say what? Thank you. Thank you. And in your head as you're walking away, you might say to yourself, what they said about me wasn't true, but what was it about how I behaved that let them believe that that was true? Because part of it is that, of course, you don't want people to think a certain thing about you, but at the end of it, you also have to think, okay, did I allow them to think that thought about me? Right? Did I not behave in a way that covered all of my bases so that they would. And sometimes people will think what they want. That's fine. But maybe, just maybe, some of the critique that we get that we feel is unfair, we open the door for it. We left the door open. Right? If somebody wants to make sure that nobody can say something about them, for example, being dishonest, that nobody can say anything about them being dishonest with money or with business, what kind of activity or behavior does that person do? They're very thorough. They communicate. Hey, you know what? I got this much money. I know that half of it is yours. I'm putting it in this envelope. Here, here's a picture. I'm sending you a picture of your money. Person responds back, relax. You don't got to be so over the top. Stop being so formal. And you say, no, 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 I get it. But you know what? I just want to make sure just so I don't forget, just you don't forget. That kind of behavior. Because then if the person later comes back and criticizes, right, and I, I didn't do all the precautions, I wonder myself, maybe I need to be a little bit better at being a person that presents myself as full of integrity and honesty, okay? Fuldale said the absolute essence of zuhud is to be content with Allah. The one who is content is the zahid, the one who is truly free of need. Truly free of need. We did this a couple weeks ago for Gaza, fill your shopping cart and then donate that amount to Gaza, right? One of the good activities that you can do similar is when you go online or when you go fill your shopping cart and then start to empty it. It's such an interesting experience. I do this with my kids, but really, all of us, we're just older kids, right? I do this with my kids. We go to the toy store, we look at some of the toys, and we look at all of them. And the kids are like, Dad, you can afford all of this, right? That's the problem. They come to Roots and they're like, all right, we're good. And I'm like, no, 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 that's not how that works. That, and I, we have them pick, you know, one or two or three toys, and then we say, okay, put two of them back. You know, and that is such a painful experience. I mean, I'll share with you tonight, subhanAllah, it's like, I hate sharing these stories, but this was really emotional for me because my son has been asking for something, it's $10, and okay, it's a World Cup replica trophy. I was like, let's just get the real thing eventually, inshallah, okay? Um, so he's been asking for it, he's got into soccer recently. So, you know, my wife and I are trying to like teach our kids about understanding what's going on in Gaza at the scale of a six-year-old kid. So I showed him some pictures of some of the children that are there and some of the posts that I've gotten from some of the charities that are on the ground of them receiving toys and them getting, you know, the psychosocial, like obviously there's food, there's shelter, there's safety, there's water, there's hygiene, but then there's also the psychosocial element of it, right? Which is that they need something to keep them occupied, their minds and their hearts so that they're not constantly thinking about the devastation that they're experiencing. May Allah Ta'ala be with them. So I was showing them some pictures and I asked my son, I swear to God, this is crazy. I said, do you, do, you want, do you want me to buy you this replica trophy for $10? Or would you rather give it to a child in Gaza? And he was, and I know, you said, oh man. I'm like, why would you do that? I wanted to see. And he couldn't answer. He started crying. 
because he was like, <laughs> he was like, can I, can I give it and get the trophy? And I'm trying to explain to him, like, if you give it, Allah will give it to you. And I, I saw him crying, not because, not because he, he was like upset, but because he knew what the right answer was. And those tears were like his nefs, right? His nefs was just being like strangled. Because he was like, I know, I know. Like I'm looking at pictures of kids in a UN school, 300 of them crowded around one clown. And the clown looked tired. And, he, <laughs> and he's like, I know that the right decision is to give the $10. I know it. But he's like, but I want this. But he goes, but I know that it's better to do that. So he was trying to negotiate, right? So we all, every one of us, he's six. I'm almost 36. What's the difference? Don't I feel that too? Don't I put stuff in my shopping cart and then think to myself, isn't it better that I, do I really need this? Isn't it better that I give it to somebody who needs it? We all go through that, right? So zuhud is when you are need free. You're able to experience that, right? MashaAllah, he did. He made the right choice. He gave, uh, you know, he gave it, he donated it. I made him type it in and donate it, subhanAllah. And then I told him, I said, make dua to Allah. Allah. Allah might give it to you. And he goes, okay, I'll make dua. And then, I, of course, I ordered it. But look, but look, I'll, I'll explain to you why. And one of my old friends taught me this. He said, it's important for you. And this isn't, this isn't gaming the system. He said, it's important for you to teach your kids about dua by being the facilitator of their duas. Because just because you're doing it doesn't mean it's not coming true. If your kid makes dua for something and you buy it and give it to them, didn't Allah give it to them? Yeah, he used you to do it, but he gave it to them. So I'm trying to teach my kid, like, hey, if you give somebody something, Allah will reward you and give you what you want too. And Allah will not decrease you. He actually said, he goes, he goes give them the money and, and they can buy whatever they want and they don't even have to buy me the trophy. And I was like, I don't think that was an option. <laughs> but anyways, so the point being is that all of us experience that same, those same tears, all of us experience that. We know that's what zuhud is. That's the battle. Ibn Taymiyyah said zuhud is to abandon all of those things which will be of no benefit in the next world. Wara is to leave the things whose repercussions you fear for the next world. Okay, so these are all just the different definitions. Um, but I will share with you one thing because I thought this is important. This line right here. So he said, if you read all those definitions, sometimes you get the impression that zuhud means that you are... Like even up here it says, Zuhud is to abandon six things. Wealth, appearance, leadership, people, life, and everything else besides Allah. If you read a lot of these statements without context, you might just walk out of here and be like, I'm going to go buy, I'm going to go wear like a rice sack. Like I'm going to, I'm not going to do anything anymore. I'm just going to, but it's interesting because that's not what Zuhud actually is. Zuhud is less about your physical manifestation. It's more about your emotional connection. So he says, this does not, or she says, this does not, however, mean that one must abandon all their responsibilities. In their time, no one was considered more of an ascetic than Prophet Suleiman and Dawood, but they were the ones who possessed wealth and kingdom. They were kings, okay? And they got married. Like, they weren't celibate. They weren't people that chose to not be married and just live lives of poverty. No, that's not what Zuhud meant. What it meant, our prophet was considered the most zahid of all people. And he had nine wives. He was married, Ali ibn Abi Talib, Abdul Rahman ibn Arouf, Zubair ibn Uthman. They were all zuhad, despite their great wealth. They were super wealthy people. Abdullah ibn al-Mubarak, who was one of the leading zuhad, owned a great deal of wealth. So all these people possessed the material means that gave them something to have, but their hearts were not connected to them. Okay, so these were all... Different descriptions. All right. So this is a chapter now on what drives people to this. And there's some stories here that we'll talk about, which I think are important again. So he said, some people have different experiences than push them to this point. Ibn Rajab quoted, says, some experience fatigue when they try to acquire worldly goods. So they leave them in order to rest. Listen to this quote. Hassan al-Basri said, Zuhud of the world rests the heart and the body. Like, there are opportunities that you have to make more money, right? There are opportunities you have to get more things. But sometimes, 
you actually would rather have the opportunity of rest and not just rest for your body, but actually just rest for your soul, like who you are. There are many people that have turned down jobs that would have paid them much more because they're looking for what, what we call in, in corporate America, right? Quality of life. I'd rather have quality of life. What does that mean? Quality of life is just the professional way of saying what? I just want to be able to live a life of good virtue. Everyone in here could work to the point where they neglect their family. Everybody in here could work to the point where they cheat and they make investments that are in, 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 uh, inappropriate, that are haram. Everyone in here could, of course. We could all do things that are haram to earn wealth. Absolutely. It's open. It's available. But we choose not to, and we avoid those pathways because we understand the value of giving the heart its rest and its due connection to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Some fear that their share of the next world will decrease by engaging in futile worldly activities. Some people became zuh zuhad or zahids because they were afraid that maybe I'm going to give, I'm going to use all my capital for this life. This is actually a really good activity to think about. How many of you make dua regularly? You guys make dua? Okay. In your head, you don't have to raise your hand. I want you to take an inventory in your head. How much of your dua is dedicated for something in the dunya versus the akhirah? Just do a percentage. What percentage of your du'as are for this life versus the akhirah? You don't have to answer, but just think about that. That number, that percentage, is a really, really interesting indication of something. Ideally, right, ideally, it would be more for the akhirah because obviously you're going to make du'a more for that which is infinite. But at least a safe ratio would be one to one would be 50%, right? Why? Because the Prophet ﷺ taught us this dua. رَبَّنَا آتِنَا فِي الدُّنْيَا حَسَنَا وَفِي الْآخِرَةِ حَسَنَا وَقِنَا عَذَابِ النَّارِ He added that last bit in there. So maybe our ratio should be 51% or 49 to 51, right? Dunya to akhirah. We should think to ourselves, where is my focus? If my focus is constantly on material, guess what? Allah might give you everything you ask for. He might. And if my akhirah du'a is only 10 seconds, but my dunya du'a was 40 minutes, and I was begging Allah for everything, professional, academic, personal, spouse, house, all of these things, Allah might give me all of those things. And then I show up in the akhirah, and I don't have, I didn't attain, I didn't reach the level that I wanted. I didn't get the forgiveness that I was yearning for. And I think to myself, maybe it's because I didn't spend any time asking for those things. So, Instituting, regimenting, prescribing some akhirah dua is a good way to remind yourself to be disconnected and not just to trade all of those things in the next life for this life. Others fear that the lengthy accounting will be required for their worldly matters. Remember that part of the mindset of a person is that they understand Allah will ask about every single penny. Allah will ask about every single penny that we spent in this life. You know, what's the value of a dollar now with inflation? <laughs> You think to yourself, this is worth nothing. No, Allah will ask about every single unit of currency, of wealth that we earned. How did we earn it? Where do we spend it? So many people get confused by this hadith, but this is what it's referring to. The first people to enter paradise will be those who are poor. They have less to answer for. They had less temptation, less fitna that they can engage in. And so they will actually be on the day of judgment in the front of the line. The people who made more and more and more, it's not that they're guaranteed, not that they're, they have, they're doomed, no. But they will be at the back of the line because they have a lot more audit to go through. Right? It's not just the IRS we should be afraid of. We have to think about the audit on the Day of Judgment. Okay? Some have seen the many faults of this life, such as its inconsistency. You know, one of the beauties of heartbreak one of the beauties of your having your heart broken, whether it's by a relationship or whether it's by anything, right? One of the beauties of these moments is that Allah, dis He uses that to disconnect you from being so attached, okay? The, the story that always comes to my mind is when I bought my first car that I loved and the day after I was parked outside and there was a hailstorm. And I remember seeing, like witnessing the hail fall 
onto the car and just destroy the car, right? And I remember being like, wow, why didn't I just buy this car tomorrow? You know, why did Allah let me buy that car yesterday? <laughs> that was my first thought. And then there was an uncle that just walked up next to me. We were at, okay, and you don't want to know the worst part? I was at like an Amin or an Aqika for a kid I didn't even know. I was like, what on earth? I'm being punished for being good. So then I'm standing there at the window looking at my car being pelted by these, you know, Tayron Ababil, right? These... <laughs> <laughs> like there were these stones coming from the sky that were just destroying this car. And subhanAllah, this uncle walked up to my very, very old senior uncle, very like, you know, and he goes, I have lived in this city for 40 years. I've never seen a hailstorm like this. <laughs> you know, and I think things like that happen. Things like that happen so that your heart disconnects from things, right? And subhanAllah, some of the really pious people, when they're tested with something, they begin, in the beginning, right, everyone like cries, everyone feels upset, everyone gets hurt. Some of the very pious people at later stages in their life, when bad things happen to them, they would start to laugh. They would start to laugh. And I don't know if anyone's gotten there yet. I know we're 30 and up, but maybe we're not there but when you start to laugh and you say to yourself, subhanAllah, you know, I, I it, sometimes you just say to yourself like, wow. And then, the, you know, that you start to have it in your mind, like, alhamdulillah, could have been worse, could have been worse, right? So when people see faults of this life, like it's inconsistency, it's exhaustion, the large numbers of wicked people who crowd the path to it, 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 it disenfranchises us from falling in love with the dunya, which is okay which is okay. So whenever you get tested or broken, just say Alhamdulillah. Allah is clearing away the fog, right? When things are not working out. It doesn't mean that when things work out, it's bad. But anytime a test is in your path, just say Alhamdulillah. Someone was on, once asked, what made you denounce the world? What made you a Zahid? He said, it's dishonesty, it's extreme aversion, and it's contemptible advocates. People who love the world live angry. Because this dunya is a really, really tough place. People who love the world are angry. Because everyone goes through the same disappointment at some level, right? Everyone doesn't get the job they want. Everyone gets rejected once in their life at least. Everyone gets hurt. Everyone has to go through bad experiences. People who are obsessed with the dunya, all of those experiences make them more angry. But people who disconnect from the dunya, they handle it with a lot more grace and patience and perspective than others, okay? Some Zahids notice the inferiority of the world in the sight of Allah, and they too despise it. Fuldale said regarding this, if the world and all it contains was presented to me without needing to give an account for it in the next world, I would still despise it, just as a person hates for a corpse to touch his clothes. So basically, he says, I got to the point where even if nothing in this world was haram and I could do everything and there was no problem, I still wouldn't. It's just not worth it, right? Okay, we'll move forward, inshallah, and get some of the other. All right, so now the author, or Aisha Buley, the, 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 the translator, she goes into sanctioned and unsanctioned. Because again, it's very possible that a person can do things that they think are spirituality, but they're not. Okay, so for example, like we fast. We fast Ramadan, and we fast, you know, you can fast Mondays and Thursdays. You can fast the three white days in the middle of the month, every Islamic month. You can fast, if you really want to fast, you can fast every other day. But what about if I wanted to fast every day? Is fasting good? Is it a good deed? Yes? Yes or no? I'm not getting enough. Uh, all right. Is fasting a good deed? Okay. Should I fast every single day? Why not? Who knows why not? Who knows? Hmm? No idea. It just doesn't sound good. That's good. Your heart's in the right place. Did you know that there was an explicit hadith of the Prophet where he forbade it? He said, you are not allowed to fast every day. It is haram. But that's crazy because it's a good thing. How is, it, how is it haram to do a good thing over and over and over again? What's the problem? The Prophet when he engaged with a companion who wanted to fast, right? Listen to these stories. He told them that your body has a right on you, okay? 
The Prophet ﷺ one time entered a masjid and there was a rope that was hanging between two of the pillars. So he walks up and he says, what is this rope? And they responded, the rope belongs to Zainab. When she is praying and she gets tired, she hangs onto the rope. The Prophet ﷺ said, take it down. Take it down. You should stand and pray as long as you have energy. And then when you are tired, you should sit down. Which means that what? You should rest or you can sit and pray. Right? If it's nafil, you can sit and pray. So this hadith alone now introduces this new concept, which is what? Not everything that looks spiritual and religious is right. Because sometimes in your journey to be spiritual, you can actually damage yourself. If it's unguided, if it's not sanctioned, if it's outside the parameters of what's healthy. Abdullah bin Amr, he narrated, he said that the Prophet Sallallahu said to me, I have been told that you spend the night in prayer and fast in the day. So the Prophet came to him and said, hey, I heard something. Is it true that you spend every night in prayer and you fast every day? Abdullah bin Amr said, yes, I do that. And imagine he's probably thinking like, okay, good, I'm going to get my, you know, my, my reward now. He said, if you do that, your eyes will become weak and you will be exhausted. And then he said, what? Your, fa- your body has a right upon you and your family has a right upon you. So fast sometimes and do not fast other times. And pray, but also sleep, also rest. So the Prophet Sallallahu here, who's the messenger of Allah, who's receiving the Qur'an, who's teaching everybody, is noticing some of these people doing things and their excitement or their aspirations are getting the best of them. And he's saying that you need to make sure that you rein it in. So what does this mean? This means that there is a form of spirituality which is good. And there's a form which is too much. And who decides what's too much and what's not, and, and what's not too much? The Prophet Sallallahu His example, his moderation, his middle of the path spirituality is not mean, it doesn't mean middle that it was deficient, but it means middle that it was balanced. It was right exactly where it needed to be. And so he forbade Abdullah bin Amr from fasting consecutive days and spending the whole night in prayer. Why? Because this person would be unable to be a person in society. He wouldn't be able to take care of his responsibilities, his family, his friends, etc. So then he told him, look, if you have to fast a lot, if that's what you feel like you want to do, then fast the fast of Dawood. He would fast one day and not fast the next, and he never fled from his enemy, which means that he was never too exhausted. Okay? Even the Prophet ﷺ opposed the trend of celibacy and monasticism. Sometimes people, they interpreted religiosity as, oh, you know what? I'm never going to get married. I'm never going to be in society. You know, some people now, when they want to be spiritual, they, what? they cut off all their friends. They want to get more religious. They're like, all right, guys, all of you, be gone. That's not religiosity. The Prophet ﷺ had friends. And last I checked, no one was more religious than him. So it's not about having friends or not having friends. It's not about when you come close to Allah, you have to become antisocial. That's not how it works. There's a hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu I love this hadith, where the companions, they were on a, a journey, and the companions were sitting around a campfire. And the Prophet Sallallahu came out from his tent, and he had a cane. And he was a little bit older at this point in his life, in his middle, mid to late 50s. No offense if anyone hears that. So he was a little bit older, right? He was, he was classic, mashallah, right? At his peak. So he was standing on his cane, and the companions, they were all having conversation. They were laughing. They were, you know, they were talking to each other. And one of the companions said, I noticed the Prophet Sallallahu he kept leaning on his cane, and then he kept switching feet. He kept leaning on his cane, and he switched feet. He would, first he would stand on his right, then he would go to his left, then he'd go to his right. What does that usually mean? When you switch feet, what does that mean? You're tired. Yeah, your feet, you're tired. And it's late at night. You're on a journey. There's a campfire outside. I mean... The Prophet ﷺ probably wants to go to sleep, right? Like, that's, he probably is exhausted, wants to get some rest. But what is he so engaged in that he doesn't want to leave is that he doesn't want to leave the gathering of the community. He's sitting there with his friends. They're hanging out. They're having a good time. So he is going back and forth, back and forth, وسلم, and his feet are getting restless. And you can imagine he wants to go to bed because he's got to wake up and pray to Hajjud in a couple hours, but he can't get himself to pull away from the community, the gathering that they're having. So religiosity does not demand that you have to be antisocial. 
that you push people away. No, Bilax, right? The exact opposite. You actually should be a person of community. The surest example of the Prophet Sallallahu worship can be found in the group of three. These are the three people that all committed that they would never, ever get married, that they would never go to sleep, and that they would never eat food. They would stay constantly in worship. The Prophet Sallallahu told them that you cannot do this. This is not what I've prescribed and you're not allowed to do this. Okay, so let's go ahead now and read some of the descriptions of the Prophet Sallallahu and his zuhud then. How did he engage in the world in a way that sufficed him? We got about six more minutes, inshallah. Okay, so he says, his, first let's talk about his perspective. What is the perspective of the Prophet Sallallahu in his world? He says, my example of this, of the world that I am in, he says, Mali wali dunya is what? Innama methali wa methali dunya karakibin. That I am just a person that is on a journey. I'm riding something. I'm riding my animal. I'm going somewhere. Wa anna fi dhilli shajaratin. And as I'm on my journey, I decide that I want to sit down and take a break under the tree. Okay? Thumma raha wa tarakaha. And then after I rest, I leave. He said, that's me in the dunya. Is that I'm on my journey. I see this tree. I go and I relax in the shade. And then I get up and I leave. What does this perspective do to a person? How do you guys feel when you read this hadith? And he's talking about the dunya. He's not talking about his day. He's saying, this is my life. My life is that I see it like the shade of a tree. All 63 years that he had. It was just sitting under the shade of a tree. How does that change your perspective? That baby time, that. Yeah. How does it change your perspective? Yeah. Well, I was kind of related to the Hayat and Salam movement and kind of what that means. I wasn't a member of it, but like, mm. so it really, it really lived like a day, a part of a day. Yeah. Yeah. Compared to who I grew up around. Mm -hmm. it, it gives you the impression that your life is a blip. And now take it a step further. When your life is a blip, how do you behave? How do you act? Huh? Hmm? Chill. You're chill. Very good. Yeah, that's a good way of putting it. What were you saying? Mm-hmm. Well, not attached to anything, but the Prophet ﷺ had friends. He had belongings, right? He didn't have a lot. So how, did he, how do we balance these two? Because he's saying here, because some people could read this hadith and they could be like, really, really, they could damage their relationships. They could like lose. But how did he balance that, right? You gave a good example. He was just chill, right? Which is like probably like a great way of putting it. put it in the commentary. We should submit it. <laughs> Prophet ﷺ was chill, alayhi salatu salam. That's true though, Really? And chill in what way? I mean, look at this. The stranger, right? He told Abdullah bin Omar, be in this life like a stranger. Anyone heard this hadith before? He said, be in this life like you're a stranger or you're just on your way on a path. The stranger does not strive for honor in the world and they are not concerned with its apparent humiliation. Think about how emotionally invested you are in certain elements of your life. Think about how disappointed you get in certain moments in your life. Think about how, how much you strive for certain things in your life. The litmus test now is, is this moment just the shade of the tree that I'm sitting under? Or will it extend beyond that? Right? The degrees on my wall, the, na the, the letters after my name, the LinkedIn timeline of my career growth, is that all in the shade of this tree or is it after that? If it goes beyond the shade, and it stays with you as you journey off into the akhirah, then you should actually work hard on it. That's why family, you should work hard on. Friendships, good friendships, you should work hard on. Yourself as a person, your self-care, your iman, you should work hard on. But the reputation, those things, the honor that people might give you or may not give you, at the end of the day, should it affect your sleep at night? No, it shouldn't. And the cool thing about 30 and up is that all of us have naturally hit a stage where you really start to care less and less about these things ultimately. 
It's almost like Allah gives you that gift when you hit 30. That you just kind of stop caring about some of these things. This person has their own concerns and people have their own concerns. The books of Hadith are filled with narrations describing the Prophet ﷺ's interaction. Listen to the food of the Prophet ﷺ. What would he eat? Omar ibn al-Khattab spoke about all the goods of the world the Prophet had, uh, that people had gained. And then he said, after speaking about everything that people had gained, then he said, sometimes I would see your Prophet. Listen to how strong this is. Sometimes I would see your Prophet and he could not even find a date to eat when he was hungry. I mean, you're talking about a person that at his level, in his lifetime, was, in the, was equivalent to the, to the kings of his lifetime. You know, one time Omar, he saw the Prophet ﷺ walking. This is the next hadith. Well, we'll talk about this. He saw the Prophet ﷺ walking and his chest was uncovered. He was wearing his shawl and his chest, his like... Uh, like abdomen slash the whole like thoracic area was uncovered and he laid down or I'm sorry, he was walking and Omar saw him and he saw lines. He saw lines on his body from what? From his bed. His bed was nothing more than a straw mat with some leaves under it. That was his bed. And you know, it's so minimal. It's so subhanAllah. If we saw it now, we might not even know what it is. The equivalent of like cardboard. It's just, it was, it was a leather, it was a piece of leather that was stretched out with palm leaves under it. That's all he slept on. And Omar saw this and he saw the indentation of the leather and the leaves on his side and Omar started crying. And he said, Ya Rasulullah, it's not fair. It's not fair. And the Prophet said, what's not fair? He says, not fair that you're the prophet of Allah and this is how you sleep. And the kings of Persia and Rome, they sleep on the most luxurious, most soft, most comfortable mattresses. And you, you're the messenger of Allah and you have to sleep like this. You guys ever hear stuff like this before? Omar, the same thing that we feel. Why do Muslims get treated this way? Aren't we on the truth? He's the same one that would say, Ya Rasulullah, alasna al haqq wa hum al batil. Like he, he would say like, Muslims, aren't we on the truth? And the Prophet ﷺ would always correct him gently and say, Omar, we don't look for our reward here. He says, would you rather have it here, Ya Omar, or there? I would rather have it there. That's what he used. And Omar, he realized the lesson there was that if having it there means not having it here, sign me up. Sign me up. But if having it here, like the people of Rome and Persia, no offense if you're Roman or Persian, the people of Rome, having it here, if that means that they're going to disconnect from Allah, I don't want to come near it. Right? Sallallahu alayhi wasallam. Aisha, she said, think about this. The next time you say to yourself, I have no food. What is there to eat? Nothing. Anyone's parents slap them when they said that? You don't have to, you know, they'll tell you, you know how I grew up? You don't have to look at how they grew up. Look at how the Prophet Sallallahu was in his adult life. Aisha said the family of Muhammad did not eat bread made of wheat, for two days in a row, he did not have access to bread that he could eat it two days in a row. If he had bread one day, if he had bread Monday, that meant he couldn't have it again until Wednesday. They just didn't have enough. They didn't have enough bread. Anas said the Prophet ﷺ did not eat at a table until he died. Meaning, it's not that when he passed away the day before he ate. No, meaning he never ate at a table. He ate on the ground. He sat on the ground and he ate. He did not eat fine bread. The, you, know, you know the bread that your kids like? That refined, white, soft bread, the fluffy one? And then you know when you try to make them healthy, you put the one that has like pebbles in it basically, all the full grain stuff? I want you to imagine something even more grainy than grained bread. They would use it, but they didn't have the tools to, to make the grain into a fine flour. It was just like rocks that they would roll against each other and they still had all of the different, you know, shells and all of that in it. And they would make it with water. They would put it into a paste. They would cook it over fire. And you had basically like the healthiest roti you could ever imagine. That's what they were eating. The most fiber in bread you could ever imagine was there, subhanAllah. And that's what he ate. He did not eat the nice, soft, pillowy bread ever in his life. Never once enjoyed it. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Ibn Battal he comments on this, and we'll end here. He said he only did this to sacrifice the luxuries of this world 
in favor of the eternal life. He was only concerned that with wealth, if it aided him for the next world, whenever he got something, he would give it away. People cooked him nice food, by the way. People would make him nice food. He would do two things. You know what he would do when people gave him nice food? Number one, he would call others to eat with him. So he didn't want to offend people. Someone cooked, he's not going to say, like, okay, I don't want it. So he would say, come, come eat with me. He would never, ever eat it by himself. We are the opposite. Someone gives us something nice, we're like, I got plans. You know? Number one, he would invite people. Number two, he would pass it on. He would get a fresh dish. He would say, you know what? So-and-so, they love this. I'm going to give it to them. And he would pass it to them. He would pass it to them. He did this only with things that he received for the next life. He did not require wealth. In essence, this narration does not say that poverty is better than affluence, but it does indicate being content with what you have and abstaining from the indulgences of this world. This is the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. I wanted to do one more and then we have Isha. Aisha, she narrated. There's one that I wanted to share with you, subhanAllah. Oh, it's not here. Okay, we'll continue next week, inshallah. I wanted to share one with you about his clothes. That is just, it blew me away, subhanAllah. We ask Allah Ta'ala to give us the ability to be content and grateful for what we have. We ask Allah Ta'ala to allow us to never complain about the things that we have, but to only see the good in them. We ask Allah Ta'ala to allow all the challenges that we experience in life to disconnect us from needing material things. We ask Allah Ta'ala to make us people that are grateful to Him, that are content with Him, and that we don't spend on ourselves more than we need to, but we rather spend on others and give them what they need. Ya Allah, Ya Rahman, Rahimin. We ask Allah Ta'ala to be with those who are being oppressed right now. We ask Allah Ta'ala to uplift the oppression from them. We ask Allah Ta'ala to make the difficulty easy for them, to soften the challenges for them. We ask Allah Ta'ala to give all of those who have passed away shahada and that he accepts them into Jannah. We ask Allah Ta'ala to give relief and to give strength to those who have lost loved ones. We ask Allah Ta'ala to make us a means of relief for those who need help. Ya Arhamur Rahimeen. Subhanak Allahumma bihamdik. Nashadu an la ilaha illa anta nastaghfiruka wa natubu ilayk. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Jazakumullah khairan. This Friday night, by the way, we have our uh, um, bonfire for our adult community here, alhamdulillah. And then Saturday morning we have our hike, inshallah, at uh, Arbor Hills, or Arbor Creek, Arbor Hills? Arbor Creek Hills over here. It's five minutes from here, inshallah. So we got some stuff going on this weekend, inshallah. It's a good chance for everybody to get together, to see each other. Of course, you know, Palestine is always going to be on our hearts and minds, and we'll be able to share, you know, uh, thoughts and ideas with each other, inshallah, and be able to process it together as a community. So we encourage everyone to join us, inshallah, Friday night and Saturday morning. Bi'idnillah. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Isha is at 8.15, so they're going to start in about one minute, inshallah. So if you want to cut through, you can. This hallway will take you there. You can take your shoes with you, and you'll be at the Musalla in 30 seconds. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa Yeah, it's like, you're going to be